All right, um, week two in our class on the prophets. Today we're going to be talking about the major prophets in general for a little while. And then we're going to get into specifically the book of Isaiah. This is our outline for the class. Last week we did an introduction, the place of the prophets. All of the videos from last week from all three classes are now available on our website along with the uh, PowerPoint materials or PDF if you, if you prefer that. So you can go on to litchapala.org, that's Lakeside Institute of Theology, litchapala.org, and review those videos. Um, again, no cost for the classes, no cost for going online and doing any of the video stuff. But you can pick up the introduction from last week if you care to. Today again, Major Prophets and Isaiah. Next week we will continue with the Major Prophets really for three weeks. Next week we'll look at Jeremiah and Lamentations. And we'll talk about the fact that Lamentations is not technically one of the Major Prophets, but Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, which is a, it's a song of woe, a song of grief over his experience of the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple. And since it was written by Jeremiah, we included, it's, it's right next to Jeremiah in the Bible, and we include it when we consider Jeremiah. And then week four, uh, the last two of the major prophets, Ezekiel and Daniel. Um, then week five, the book of the twelve, the minor prophets. The uh, Hebrew Bible takes all twelve of the minor prophets and lists them as one book called the book of the twelve. We'll talk about that in general and then look at Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Then continue with the uh, minor prophets for the next two weeks, week six and week seven, and then finish with a one-hour message of the prophets lecture on the, the eighth week, and then the second hour of that day, uh, we will have our final exam. Again, three quarters of the way through the class, I'll provide you with all of what you really need to know from this class, I believe, and you can focus on learning that material, even if you're not taking this class for credit, either a certificate or a degree, I, I keep saying this, I encourage you to go ahead and study the material and take the class anyway, because you'll learn it a lot better. If you want to get a certificate or a degree, it is required that you take the test, okay? And also, if you wanted to get one of the Old Testament survey books that we're using for this class, and we'll use for classes in the future, I do have those available. They're 400 pesos, okay? Any questions about any of that? Ron? No, I was going to ask a question of what's to come. I mean, about today. About today. Okay, the major prophets and Isaiah. Yes. Okay. And you'll probably be covering it, but I, I got really uh, confused about the sign of Emmanuel, the double sign, and there are apparently three, three uh, um, translations of it or interpretations of it. Um, well, let's get into that, okay? okay. Uh, well, if I don't address it today, then we can talk about it maybe in the break or afterwards, okay? Um, all right, let's get started. Last week I showed you this basic uh, diagram, which is there is a difference in structure between the um, Hebrew Bible, that is the Bible of the Jewish people, called the Tanakh, and the traditional Protestant scripture. In particular, in the Old Testament, uh, we have 39 books in our Protestant, I say Protestant because the Catholic Bible the, uh, has several other books called the Apocrypha in them. So we have 39 books. Last term we looked at the law, the first five books. That's why I want that back in the back, because nobody can sign it if it's sitting up here. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and get that or leave that back here, and then people can go by and sign it. Uh, it's all right. It's, people start passing it around. And it, um, the, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the there are three sections, which are the Torah, that's the same, whether you're looking at the, the Christian Bible or the Hebrew Bible, but then it, they divide up differently. In the, in the Hebrew Bible, they then go on to the uh, Nevaim, which are the prophets, and then the third section is Ketuvim, or writing. We are going to follow the traditional Protestant structure, the reason being because the books are outlined that way, and most of what you'll run into break them down that way, which looks at the law, and then 12 books called the history books, from Joshua through Esther. Now Joshua, for instance, is listed as one of the prophetic books in the Hebrew Bible, uh, but we're going to stick with this outline. Then the books of wisdom, which are Job through the Song of Psalms, or Song of Solomon, um, Psalms, Proverbs, those various books in there. And then the books of prophecy. We are uh, looking at the books of prophecy, which is Isaiah through Malachi. Um, the uh, standard way to break those up in the Protestant Bible are the first 
of those books, Isaiah through Daniel, are called major prophets. And then, as I said earlier, the next 12 are called the minor prophets, or the book of the 12 in the Hebrew Bible. Um, it's just an active day. All sorts of stuff going on. People coming and going, and you know, I'm happy with um, So, the difference in the major prophets and the minor prophets is one purely of length. The major prophets are longer. Isaiah is one of the longest books in the Bible. As I'm sure you know because you read it this week, right? Yes. yes. Um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through the whole the whole thing today. So you're gonna get a, a full understanding of all of those things because it's when you just sit down to read Isaiah and you don't have a sense of the structure. I I confess it can get a little overwhelming. So we're gonna walk through that today. But the major, the books of the major prophets are simply longer. The minor prophets are much shorter, as short as one chapter uh, in some cases. So we will, we will get into uh, the major prophets today. I also showed you this chart last week, which is again is online. Um, in addition to having major prophets and minor prophets, those are the, are the writing prophets, the ones that wrote books of the Bible. All of the books of the Bible uh, prophets are called the latter prophets. That's what the Hebrews call them. The earlier prophets are called the former prophets or the non-literary prophets. In this chart up here, I mentioned particularly, for instance, Elijah and Elisha, two very important prophetic figures in the Old Testament, but they did not write any books. So they are part of the former prophets or the non-literary prophets. When you get into the latter prophets, you get into the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and we add Daniel to that in our discussions. Daniel is considered one of the books of the writing, the uh, Ketuvim in the Hebrew Bible, okay? So then we'll get later down to all of these, these guys, the Hosea through Malachi and various minor prophets. But this chart tells you who they prophesied to, who the kings were, I'm going to look at that a little bit, uh, what the approximate dates were, and where they were born for all of these prophets. So that chart is online. I think that could be valuable to you. Um, Ron, is everything okay? Uh, yeah, I'm just picking her up. Okay. I'm sorry, folks, and my wife was at a clinic. Yeah. She asked me to get... I knew that. I just wanted to make sure that she wasn't calling because something was more seriously wrong. Okay. Um, this... This painted sculpture here, and it's a little bit hard to see, um, it's, I think it's part of its relief, but it's painted. This is from the, the church of Jehu, uh, Jesu in uh, Rome, and it represents the four major prophets. Now, I've added lamentations, italicized in there, but you get here Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, and Ezekiel. And we, we know that because um, Isaiah is holding a, a saw. Tradition has it that Isaiah was killed by being sawed in half. That during the, re the reign of King Manasseh, that he was put in a hollow log and sawed in half. And so you'll often see him symbolized by holding a saw. And then, I don't even know if you can tell, but this is a lion. You know, it looks sort of like a pet lion. Uh, so we know that's Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den. You know, Daniel not having a problem with the lions. Um, I'm guessing, because there's no other symbols present here, that this would be Jeremiah, because Jeremiah uh, was a prophet for over 60 years. I mean, almost pretty much his whole life. And so he's usually portrayed as being quite old. Ezekiel here is younger. He too had a long career, but not as long as Jeremiah's. But the idea here is that in this church and in other places, these prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, frequently are pictured together. And as is often the case in church art, they will often have symbols so that you can tell you know, who's who? St. Peter, you always know it's St. Peter because he carries keys. Paul is bald uh, and has a curly beard. The, you always know it's the Virgin Mary because she's always dressed in blue. So there's always symbolism that, that helps you with that. But this, is a, this represents <coughs> the significance of the major prophets together. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Um, I also showed you this chart last week, and that's a time frame. The three major powers that affected the prophetic period, Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. This is the overall time frame from 1000 BC to 400 BC. The two nations of the Jewish people, Israel and Judah. And when the various prophets, uh, Jonah and Nahum, prophesied to the Assyrians, down, meaning not the Jews, their, their prophetic call was to somebody else. Nineveh, the city that Jonah was on his way to when he tried to run for it, got swallowed by the whale, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And so Nineveh, um, uh, Jonah, and Nahum 
were prophets to Assyria. Amos and Hosea were prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember after Solomon, the kingdom got split in two, the nation of Israel in the north, the nation of Judah in the south. Most of the prophets were either focused on the nation of Judah or during the exile period. Daniel and Ezekiel were the Babylonian exile, and then the return was Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So the dots here, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, gives you a sense of when and where those prophets prophesied. And that is available online to you. Another chart. I created this one for you all. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Uh, to whom did they prophesy? What was the focus of their prophecy during the reigns of which kings? What are the dates? And what's the historical setting? Meaning, where can you find the story in the Bible? In addition to the prophetic books being the writings, the sayings or writings of the prophets, you, we also have in Kings and uh, Chronicles and in Daniel the historical setting where they tell the story in a narrative form that's what's going on about what the prophets are prophesying. So, for instance, Isaiah was prophesying to the Jews in the southern kingdom of Judah and particularly the city of Jerusalem. The focus was Judah and Jerusalem and their relationship with God. During the reigns of the kings of Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the dates 740 to 680 BC, and you can read about what was going on then in the book of 2 Kings, chapters 15 to 21, and 2 Chronicles 26 to 30. Okay? So, same thing with Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And you can see that the dates here, they overlap somewhat. Uh, Isaiah was the earliest by, by a considerable sight. And then Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel all sort of overlap with one another. And all of them had more to do with um, Babylon. <coughs> Excuse me. And how God was going to use the nation of, of uh, the Babylonians to bring his judgment against the southern kingdom of Judah. Whereas in, in Isaiah's case, he is dealing more with the issue of Assyria and overall relations between uh, the people of Judah to God and the people of Judah to other nations. We're going to get into detail about that. But this chart will give you a comparison of all of those four in one place. Questions about any of that? Okay, now let's talk about, um, that, that's a general introduction to the major prophets. Let's talk about Isaiah, particularly, for most of the rest of our time. But Isaiah is a long book, it is a complicated book, uh, it has a, there's a lot of scholarship that has gone into it and around it, and we won't talk about that. But let's start out with some of the general facts. First, we believe, as according to the previous chart, that Isaiah prophesied from about 740 to 680 B.C., so his prophetic life was also uh, covering about 60 years. It gets complicated, and I'm going to talk about the three Isaiahs. It's actually more than two, John. I mean, we talk about, uh, Brueggemann and others talk about the two Isaiahs. I'm going to explain that to you. A lot of scholars, not many today, but in the, throughout the 20th century, they actually talked about three different Isaiahs, and we'll break it up and talk about that. But we believe that, that Isaiah prophesied during the time 740 to 680 B.C. And we're pretty clear about that because he talks specifically about which, who are kings, and we know when those kings served. So we've got a good sense of that. The title of the book obviously comes from the name of the prophetic author, Isaiah. And it's important that that is Isaiah's name, and that's what this book is called, because Isaiah, the name means Yahweh is salvation. That's what Isaiah means. And when we talk about the theme and purpose of this book, the theme is Yahweh is salvation. It has to do with the fact that Yahweh God wishes to save not only his people, if they will repent and come turn to him, but also all of the nations of the earth. In fact, the word salvation appears 26 times in the book of Isaiah. It only appears seven times in all the rest of the prophetic books. So... 26 times in Isaiah, only 7 times in the rest of the prophetic books does the word salvation occur. This is why um, yeah, uh, Isaiah has been called the evangelical prophet because of his emphasis on, on salvation and particularly on the redemptive work of the Messiah. We're going to look at some of those verses and, and whatnot in a little bit. Um, he is, the book of Isaiah is been the most influential book in the development of both Jewish and Christian theology of all of the prophetic books, and perhaps all of the Old Testament books together. 
Isaiah is quoted more in the New Testament than any other book other than the Torah. The Torah being Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books. So uh, Isaiah is quoted by Jesus uh, a, a lot by other uh, writers in the New Testament quite often. In addition to being called sometimes the evangelical prophet, he's also called the messianic prophet because so much of the book of Isaiah has to do with the Messiah. We have the prophecies about the virgin will, um, will bear a child, the prophecies about the suffering servant, that we, in hindsight, look at that and say that's an absolutely perfect description of Jesus. So we'll look at some of those verses as we go along. So Isaiah is very, very important to the New Testament and to the development of Christian theology. And why, that's why it's a very important book for us to study and understand. And the key chapter, I believe, it's difficult to say because there's a lot of key chapters, there's a lot of very important parts to this book, but um, probably if you had to pick one, we would pick uh, chapter 53, which is the suffering servant passage, which describes how the suffering servant would, although being innocent, being unwilling to defend himself, took upon himself by his stripes we were healed, took upon himself the punishment that led to the forgiveness of the sins of the whole world. A very clear messianic, a very clear Jesus uh, prophecy. And so uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah is uh, critical, again, to our Christian theology as well. Let me give you three key verses which you will recognize. The first two you will clearly recognize from Christmas time and the last one from Easter. Isaiah 7, 14 and 15 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This prophecy originally was um, a sign that Yahweh God gave to King Ahaz. Actually, what happened is King Ahaz, God said to the king, um, let me give you a sign to prove to you that I am powerful and that you can rely on me. You don't have to worry about getting other sort of political affiliations to defend you against the Assyrians or against Egypt or others. And Ahaz said, oh no, I don't want a sign. If I call for a sign, it might be tempting the Lord my God, which was actually an act of disobedience. It sounds like sort of pious humility. It wasn't. And so God said, well, if you don't have enough sense to ask for a sign, I'm going to give you one anyway. And this was the response to that. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Now, the word here for virgin can also be translated young maiden, young woman. Um, there are... There are some people who make a big deal out of that. The reason why a word that used that can legitimately be translated that way is that there is a fulfillment of this prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has a son. And we'll talk about that when we get a little bit into it. And the birth of that son is one of the signs of God fulfilling his commitment, his promise. But it's one of those already but not yet, you know, now and future kinds of things. Because there were aspects of the prophecy that were not fulfilled then. So yes, um, Isaiah's son was a partial fulfillment of that as assigned to Ahaz. But there are clearly are references in Isaiah to the fact that more of this fulfillment will come later. Which we again see as the fulfillment in Jesus Christ being born of a virgin. All right? The second verse that I have up here, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, again, you know this from Christmas time. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, if you ask 9 out of 10 Christians where that's from, they'll tell you probably the Gospel of Luke. Okay, This is the book of Isaiah. This was written in the, um, the late 8th, early 7th century B.C. So 700 years before the time of Jesus. And yet we read this and say, of course. Some of the other suffering servant passages and whatnot we look at and say, how, could, how, how can anybody argue that this doesn't relate? Um, you all know I've said a number of times one of my clients in the States is Jews for Jesus. Well, the primary way, and these are Jews who are all Messianic Jews, completed Jews. They believe in Jesus as the Messiah and as the Son of God. And their ministry is to, is to make, and this is their mission statement, to make the, 
the messiahship of Jesus an unavoidable reality to Jewish people around the world. And the way they do it is by looking at the Old Testament and saying, this is what God promised. Now, let's look at the life of Jesus. Um, and to, make, to have them see the fulfillment that occurs there. And again, that's exactly the sort of reason why Isaiah, theologically, is the most important of the prophetic books, perhaps one of the most important of all of the Old Testament books, in terms of us having our, a clear sense of our Christian theology. Okay? John? Um, you said that Isaiah had a son. Yes, at two in fact. Do you know their names? Yes, I do. And we'll get to that a little bit later, because their names are very significant, <laughs> as often is the case in Old Testament names. I mean... But they were not Emmanuel. No. No. Um, in fact, well, the, son, the son that was done in, in, uh, in fulfillment of this, I, it's like four very complicated Hebrew words, which means, um, and he will plunder and he will ravage, kind of thing, you know. Uh, and so it's not... It's nowhere near Emmanuel, but um, it's interesting how they how he <coughs> blended those two together. Yeah, his well, own son and the prophetic. Exactly, and I think that, that that we see that 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 God, you know, God's got the long term view. God addresses, fulfills His promises short term, but there is always a long term aspect to it as well. And that's one of the things Isaiah is all about. Um, we're going to talk about that. The different sections of Isaiah deal with different time periods, including some of them time periods several hundred years after Isaiah. Um, and so there, the whole book of Isaiah is about now and then. Okay, so the, sort of the one thing, the current and future king kind of issue. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, Isaiah 53, I just mentioned probably the most important of the chapters. If you had to pick one in the book of Isaiah, and that's hard to do, uh, from the suffering servant passages, Isaiah 53, 4 to 7. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Now this is just one passage of the longer suffering servant section. Uh, there actually are four songs of the servant in Isaiah. Um, this one, which is the fourth one, the last one, is the one that, that really powerfully identifies the reality of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Okay. And we believe it's prophetic in that regard. Um, one more. Um, I talked about this last week. The message of Isaiah, really, there's a, there's a three-point message of the Old Testament prophets, and Isaiah epitomizes all three of those in various sections. And so we're going to talk about the sections a little bit. We're going to break, break Isaiah down into sections and talk about what each groups of chapters within those sections mean. But first, the prophets say, you, whether they're talking to Israel or Judah, they're talking to the people of God, the, the Hebrew people, you have broken the covenant and you had better repent. So a call to repentance because of failure to meet God's expectations and the, and the commitment they made in the covenant. The second message is, you're not going to repent, there's no repentance, then there will be judgment. And that judgment will come not only on the Hebrew people, but on all nations. The book of Isaiah has sections where there are lists of nations which are called to account and judgment. But then at the same time, there are passages in Isaiah where God says that the blessing that he provides, the restoration, the fulfillment he will provide, is not just for the Jewish people, but for all nations as well. So there is both judgment and there is restoration and healing for all peoples. Third, just said this, Yet there is hope. This is the third point, both in the larger Old Testament prophetic message, but also epitomized in Isaiah. There is hope beyond the judgment of a glorious future restoration for both Israel and Judah and for all the nations. So these are the three points. You better repent or there will be judgment. You haven't repented, so here's the judgment, and it will come not only on the Jews but on all nations. But even in the midst of judgment, there is a future hope of restoration and healing. 
And as we said last week again, the specific failings of the Hebrew people, which we will see identified specifically in Isaiah, are that they were guilty of idolatry, worshiping other gods, that they were guilty of social injustice, not caring for the needs of those who were unable to care for themselves in the society, especially widows and orphans, foreigners, the poor, and then reliance on uh, religious ritualism instead of true worship. Just going through the motions, saying, okay, we're doing the sacrifice, we're showing up you know, to church on Sunday morning, whatever it is, and that should be sufficient. And God says, I don't need that. You really think that sacrificing bulls to me is all I want? I want to be in a relationship with you. And you can do all of that you want to, and it's not sufficient if it's just a ritualistic kind of religious practice and is not a fulfillment, a way of expressing your real heart commitment to me. So, idolatry, social injustice, and reliance on religious ritualism, as we said last week, one of the reasons this book is very valuable to us, all of the prophets, but Isaiah, again, epitomizes these points, is because those are still issues that we suffer today. Um, we, Christians, are idolaters, we are guilty of social injustice, we rely on religious practice, thinking that's gonna be sufficient, um, uh, and if you don't can't see how it is that pe that's true with people, then tell me, and I'll get back. I'll get into that a little bit more later on. But to me, there are other things we put put in front of God. That's idolatry. We do not care for the needs of the people. I've had people in this church, in our church, say to me, "I worked very hard my whole life for my money, and I'm not going to give it away to somebody who doesn't want to work." Okay. Jesus said, "Depart from me, you accursed, into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons, for I never knew you." because you did not care for those who were in need. Okay. Uh, we do that today, and the idea that if I show up on Sunday for an hour and um, you know maybe take a class every once in a while, then that's enough. No, that's not what God wants from us. Those are simply, the, that's the icing, that's not the cake. The cake is our personal relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about the sections of uh, Isaiah and what they're all about. <clears throat> Isaiah 1 to 39 focuses primarily on the failure of Israel, or Judah, I should say. Um, I sometimes say Israel thinking generically the Hebrew people, but remembering that Isaiah's prophecy was specifically to the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, the Jewish people of Judah have failed in their covenant commitment to God, and so there is judgment coming. But there are just little sort of lights of promises of deliverance and of restoration that come up throughout these first 39 chapters. Now, um, I want to give you what those, th th this section, the first big section, the first 39, it's almost half, um, actually itself breaks down into three parts. Chapters 1 to 12 stress pretty exclusively the judgment that's going to come on Judah for their failure to fulfill their covenant, covenant obligation to God. Then chapter 13 to 35 emphasized Yahweh's righteousness and his authority over the nations, that he is a righteous and a holy God. Justice and righteousness are things that come up in Isaiah over and over and over again. Justice and righteousness. Justice and righteousness. And they are embodied in Yahweh God. And that justice and righteousness is part of that is that he has authority not just over the Jewish people in Judah, but again over all nations, every nation. He made them all. He is the Lord over all of them. And then the third section of this first half is chapter 36 to 39 is a narrative account about Yahweh's delivery of Judah from the Assyrians. Isaiah kept telling, part of the message of the first half of Isaiah is don't, to the various kings, and in this case we get to Hezekiah uh, in this section, don't feel like you have to have a political alliance with somebody else in order to be protected, if you are following God and loyal to Him and fulfilling the covenant, God will protect you. You don't have to rely on some other political alliance. Now what had happened is, well, I'll get into it when I get into the details of that, the, the, the syrio Ephraimite war, which I told you about, uh, mentioned last week, that I'm sure you all know all the details about all that stuff. But um, ultimately it comes down in this chapters 36 to 39, King Hezekiah of Judah, has not been, you know, Hezekiah has a good reputation. He actually had made some decisions counter to Isaiah's counsel up to this point. But finally, Isaiah tells Hezekiah, even though the Assyrians by this time have already destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, and they're camped outside the walls of Jerusalem, 
Isaiah tells Hezekiah, do not give in to him. Do not surrender. Do not open the gates. Do not, you know, fall on, on the mercy of this King Sennacherib, who was the king at that point. Tiglath Pileser III was the king that had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. But the southern kingdom of Judah, right outside the gates, are the huge Assyrian army, by far the most powerful army in the world at that time. Finally, Hezekiah listens to Isaiah and says, I don't know how this is going to work, because all you have to do is look out the window. But I will rely on what you say, Isaiah, and trust God to protect us. And 185,000 Assyrians woke up the next morning to find themselves dead. King James said it. Apparently a plague struck. They loaded up their tents and camels and went back to Nineveh. Okay, and so the Jerusalem was saved. The southern kingdom of Judah lasted for a considerable while longer, for another 100 years or so. And um, God, God showed his promise. And I think I mentioned last week that Sennacherib in the royal annals or the histories um, Sennacherib along with Tiglath Pileser and other kings of Assyria went through and they talked about all the kingdoms they destroyed and all the kings that they defeated and killed and what they did to them and everything else well Sennacherib gets down to to Israel uh, or I'm sorry to Judah and to Jerusalem and to Hezekiah the king and he says and Hezekiah the king I conquered some of their fortified cities when I got to Jerusalem I penned Hezekiah up in his citadel like a bird in a cage. And that's all he says. He didn't conquer Jerusalem. He didn't. So we have an objective historical thing. We have the Assyrian annals where that agrees with the fact that Sennacherib did not conquer Jerusalem. He did not defeat Hezekiah. And so, as I said last week, it's the, first, the world's first example of political spin. He didn't defeat Hezekiah or Jerusalem, so he says, I pinned him up, you know, in his citadel like a bird in a cage. Okay, you know, wh whatever makes you feel better about yourself, Sennacherib, okay. Uh, so this is the first section. Now, uh, because all of these, these things happened during Isaiah's life, this is called by, by scholars, up until the last 20 years or so, this was called Proto-Isaiah which means 1st Isaiah, sometimes actually referred to as 1st Isaiah, these 39 chapters. Because it was thought by everybody, liberal and conservative scholars, that yes, Isaiah apparently wrote this, all these things happened in his life, we're good with that, nobody had a problem with it. But then you get to the next section of verses, Isaiah 40 to 55, focuses on the deliverance and restoration through the servant. Remember I told you they're the songs of the servant? that there would be a divine representative of God who would provide um, uh, restoration. All of this takes place after the Assyria has fallen to Babylon, which is a hundred years after Isaiah. And so, of course, because of that, uh, liberal scholars especially have said that it's not possible for Isaiah to have written this because it happened, the events that are recorded here or talked about here were written well after his life. And so how could that possibly be the case? It's because there is a presumption on the part of, of the liberal scholars that it is not possible for any predictive prophecy to have occurred. In other words, there's nothing, Isaiah nor any other prophet could have said something that's going to happen in the future. And so this was by scholars was called Deutero-Isaiah, or Second Isaiah. A lot of scholars then looked at the third section, the last ten verses, or, or chapters, I mean, uh, of Isaiah, the 11, I guess, 56 to 66. It talks about, a it's a focus on righteous living by Yahweh's true people in the meantime, while they're waiting for the fulfillment of God, and it actually talks about the destruction of Babylon. Okay, now, when this, when this was written, Assyria was in power. Babylon had not, the Neo-Babylonian Empire had not risen. The second section talks about the rise of the Babylonian Empire and the destruction of Assyria. The third section, Isaiah 56 to 66, talks about the rise of Cyrus the Great, who was the Persian king who defeated Babylon and then released the Jews to go back to Israel, the nation of Israel, to Palestine. Well. Um, Cyrus came to power 150 years after Isaiah died. And so, of course, again, the liberal scholar, and he's, he's mentioned by name in this writing. And so, of course, the liberal scholars say, ain't no way, can't happen, could, you know, can't be. 
So the liberal scholars looked at this and they said, okay, this prophetic stuff can't be real because that doesn't happen. They also said, you know, they don't, they, he couldn't mention Cyrus the Great by name. They also said that the, the um, Isaiah is identified in the first 39 chapters, proto-Isaiah, first Isaiah, but he's not mentioned by name in the other sections. Well, there might be a reason for that if it's all one book. Okay. They also claimed that there was some difference in style. And they said that the historical situations happened, again, after his life, not just could they not have been prophetic, but some things happened that could not have happened or he could not have known about. Now, interestingly enough, while that was the, his, the scholarly idea about Isaiah during most of the 20th century, and that is that there were three different writers, or maybe three different groups of writers, the first one probably being the, one, the man we call the prophet Isaiah. But liberal scholars said the others had to be somebody else. But interestingly enough, late in the 20th century, and in the last decade or so, into the 21st century, even liberal non-evangelical scholars have started to backtrack. Because they're starting to recognize that there are elements of continuity, of literary structural unity, throughout the whole of this book. There are somewhere, depending on how you want to count it, between 40 and 50 distinctive phrases, for instance, that occur all the way through this book. In addition to the fact that, in, uh, for, for us Christians, the fact that in the New Testament, I told you that Isaiah is quoted more than anything other than the Torah, well, they quote from all three of these sections of Isaiah, and in every case they identify it as being the writings of the prophet Isaiah. So unless Jesus got it wrong, you know, we have concern there. But more and more, even non-evangelical scholars are looking at this stuff, and they're saying there is unity, there is some consistency of language, and so they, as far as they've mostly been willing to go so far, is that we believe that the source document probably was the prophet Isaiah, but that other editors, and they might even, they might even concede that they might have been inspired editors, came in and added some historical details, like Cyrus's specific name, later. But the point is that the evangelical scholars, like moi, <laughs> who hold that this is all the writing of Isaiah and that the only reason to say it's not is because you don't believe in, in divine prophecy or predictive prophecy, and the liberal scholars who for many, many, many years denied any sense of continuity here, they've come closer together. They're not in one place, but they're closer together. And so um, we, we, there's a dialogue that's open now. One of the things that's happened, as I mentioned uh, again last week, is there's an increased desire or willingness on the part of liberal scholars, instead of trying to chop things up into pieces and analyze them as though, and assuming that they're separate, they had different authors and different things, to try to look at the whole thing, to try to look at the whole book of Isaiah. And in doing so, even non-evangelical -evan scholars have begun to see that there is a literary structure that's consistent. So, um, it goes so far as to one, one book, one source that I have, says, by the end of the 20th century, the standard three Isaiah view had largely been abandoned, or at least revised significantly, by even most non-evangelical Old Testament scholars. You know, the, the evangelical scholars, for instance, say, well, there are prophetic, prophetic messages in Isaiah 1 to 39, too. The one that you say is okay, there's some future prophecy in that. The fact that Josiah, the king, is prophesied many years before his life. The fact that Bethlehem is identified by name as the place where Messiah would be born. And that's recognized as the birthplace of Jesus, who's called the Messiah. And on and on and on. <coughs> Excuse me. There are a lot of other indications that this is, has much more continuity. And even liberal scholars are beginning to say, you know, it's not so easy as just one, two, three. There's more going on here, and even though we're not going to concede that there's miraculous stuff happening, uh, we can't any longer claim that these were three completely different sources, like they used to. Okay? Does that make sense? And the third one was called tr tr Trito. 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 T-R-I-T, -T, which means third. So it's first Isaiah, second Isaiah, third Isaiah, which scholars, because scholars can never say it a simple way, yeah. call Proto-Isaiah, Deutero-Isaiah, which means the second and Trito, T-R-I-T-O, Isaiah, 1st, 2nd, 3rd Isaiah. But they don't really talk like that anymore because they're recognizing the fact that it's more complicated than that. Any questions about any of that? Now, you, again, you need to be aware of that. I know last term when we were talking about uh, either 
last term of the term before, John had raised the, the point, he was reading a book by Brueggemann, which is a, a top scholar, and he was reading sec about Second Isaiah, and he's going, what's this Second Isaiah stuff? I don't only find one of them in here, okay? And by the way, another, another claim for the fact there's only one Isaiah, the people who really advocated this so strongly, like in the mid-20th century, in the 1950s, the liberal, mostly German scholars, they were saying, okay, this last one, the, 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 this last writing happened way post-exile, probably in the first century BC. Well, then they found the, around that time, they found the um, Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls have the complete book of Isaiah as one scroll, chapter 1 through 66, and it's dated before 200 BC. So it's not possible that 56 to 66 was written in 100 BC if we now have a document that's 100, 100 150 years older than that in which that's included and in which there's no indication. Actually, Isaiah was obviously one of the favorite books because the, the, the Essene community that had the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were very sort of, they were an apocalyptic community. They thought that God was going to come back right away. It was going to be the day of the Lord. There was going to be judgment and they were going to be the good guys. And Isaiah has apocalyptic passages. There's actually one section that's called the Apocalypse of Isaiah in there, and there is a lot about God judging, God coming in condemnation, but then there being the restoration, which was the whole thing the Essenes were all about. So they loved Isaiah. In fact, I think there are over 60 fragments of Isaiah found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, plus the whole thing. The most complete, the, you, you've seen the Dead Sea Scrolls where they've got like a little piece of, you know, a tiny piece of uh, papyrus that's got like three letters on it and then all that. Well, they have the whole roll, the whole scroll of Isaiah. Um, in fact, if I, uh, in one of them, I'll show it to you book. later. Is it in your book too? It's in our okay, book. You, it's in your book. Okay. Uh, I forget which book it is I'm seeing this stuff in. So, another indication that Isaiah not only wasn't written that late, couldn't have been, because we have earlier documents in that, but the fact that the Essenes, along with all the New Testament people, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the old, other Old Testament uh, people who refer to Isaiah consider it one book. John? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but to see this man Brueggemann, he's a brilliant man, mm -hmm. a brilliant Old Testament scholar. And he does a lot of good work. He does, and he, he really illustrates how the prophet brings the future into the present. Right. He, he brings the future into the present, and yet, Yet he identifies it. I, I don't think I've seen third, third Isaiah, but first and second Isaiah, yeah. and and he holds to that that I guess what he was trained in or whatever. But yet his his the text of all that he teaches is how this prophetic <coughs> is brought in, and that's the nature of prophecy is to bring in the future to the present. So if they spoke, if they spoke of the future as the past. That doesn't seem to be inconsistent with the prophetic absolutely. Narration. In fact, what you're saying is absolutely true. The book of Isaiah, not just Isaiah, some of the other prophetic books as well, a core part of their message, a fundamental part of their message is, here's what God is doing and what God will do. If you repent, it'll go this way. If you don't repent, it'll go that way. So a great deal of what the whole book is about is what is God going to do. To then say that it's not possible to have any sort of prophetic vision as to the future, you're kind of saying you're ripping the guts out of the whole idea of the book. That's the theme, is what is God going to do? When it talks about God being you know, head over all of the nations and talks about specific judgment that's going to come, you take all of that out of there, you know, you've got, I don't know what you've got, but it certainly isn't the prophetic book of Isaiah anymore. Okay. Joanne? Well, do I understand this correctly that they... Um, they would read the scrolls in the synagogue to the everyday Jewish people. Yes, the and book of Isaiah would have been read. And so how did the everyday Jew react to this? I mean, it's easy for us to see it's a lot of it's past or has happened. Right. But I just struggle with how could they possibly get it? I guess the best way to, to answer that is to say, how do Christians who hear the gospel preached every week respond to it? How good a job do we do, you know, staying with what the Word tells us? Um, I think that we see the same thing. I mean, the Jews, yes, they would have heard readings from the Old Testament every week. That was part of synagogue worship. It would have been temple when the temple still existed. 
But just because they heard it doesn't mean it's going to change their lives or they're going to, they're going to live it out. For instance, one of the things is they, the Jews, and this is what Isaiah is dealing with, the Jews felt like, okay, you're telling us we have to do sacrifice and we have to give a tenth and we have to do blah, blah, blah. I'm doing all that. The fact that I am oppressing the people that work for me and not giving them a fair wage so that they're starving, that I'm taking advantage of people and I'm cheating in business deals, I'm refusing to help care for widows and orphans who can't take care of themselves. Um, and you get the Pharisees standing up saying, you know, I thank you, God, that I'm a righteous man, that I'm not like all these other sinners, you know. And the tax collector who beats his breast and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, between those two, it was the tax collector that went home righteous, you know. Um, it was not the one who claimed to be righteous. And so the same thing was true for all of the Jewish people down through history, and the same thing is true for Christians today. We can't look down our nose at them and say, what was wrong with those people? They heard the word and they didn't pay attention to it. You know, we're right there. Um, and so I think it's that's human nature. The self-justification is a powerful motivator. That's a, the tagline I used for people who worked for me a long time ago. Is it, we'll come up with all sorts of convoluted excuses for why we're okay, even, even when we know down deep we're not. So that was very much it. Now, there are examples like uh, the King Josiah that I mentioned, when Josiah was a very young king, they found the scroll, which they believe was at least part of Deuteronomy, hidden in the temple. They were remodeling the temple. They brought the scroll, read it to him, and he tore his clothes and launched probably the most comprehensive religious reform that we have recorded in the Old Testament, tearing down places of worship to false gods, Baal and Asherah, etc., instituting appropriate worship, calling people to judgment and righteousness, reading this publicly. And so there were cases where people's lives were, you know, their hearts were broken and affected and their lives were changed because of hearing this word. But the fact is that most people, it just, you know, so, yes? I don't know if I read the book too fast or what, but how big an ear do quotations of the people and of those persons of authority did Isaiah had. Actually, Isaiah did pretty well. Um, in fact, Hezekiah didn't listen to some of his comments earlier on, but later on he did, even when he didn't say no to Sennacherib and the Syrian army. Um, Isaiah was apparently from a wealthy family. He had access to the royal courts, readily had access, and they quite often listened to him. I mean, he apparently had a good reputation. Uh, Manasseh, one of the very worst kings ever, sort of in half, but other than that, um, <laughs> Up till then, he seemed to be doing okay. Uh, you compare that to Jeremiah, who preached probably his whole life, from when he was a teenager until very old age, nobody ever listened to him. Ever. He was beaten, he was stoned, he was thrown in prison. The people wouldn't listen to him, the kings wouldn't listen to him, the religious establishment wouldn't listen to him. Jeremiah, was, who's called the, you know, the, uh, the, weeping, the prophet. weeping prophet, <laughs> He had a reason to be weeping. Well, you compare that, you know, Jeremiah to Isaiah. Isaiah had had an audience. People would listen to him. Not always. I mean, they, you know, they, they'd see how much of it they could get away with, but they never completely discounted him or tried to to diminish his ministry or even destroy him, like they did. So his birth and privilege helped him um, have the right connections so that the message could be heard. Absolutely. Where others. Possibly suffered greatly because it didn't have that. And Jeremiah position. more than any. So most of the others, Ezekiel and others, were somewhere in between. Okay, uh, Ezekiel was a little more toward Jeremiah than Isaiah in that regard. But Isaiah did get attention. Now, part of what you need to understand the job of these prophets, uh, it had to do intimately with the king, because um, at various times, once Israel had a king, the king was seen as the high priest of the religion in effect, not technically, but the one, King David, you know, bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, uh, uh, Saul getting himself in trouble because he assumed he had the right to offer a sacrifice when, instead of waiting for Samuel, uh, but there was always a sense in which the king, ultimately, even more than the priesthood, they were the ones responsible for carrying out the, because it's a theocracy, it was a religious government. They were, the king was responsible for carrying out the religion, the religious practice of the people. Which meant if you had a good king like Josiah, or for the most part Hezekiah, um, you ended up, or, or David, David who was uh, for all of his doing a couple of horrible things, he still, his heart was for the Lord. They led the people 
back to God. And they, they created an enthusiasm on the part of the people for worshiping Yahweh and being in a relationship with Him and acting the way they're supposed to. But you get somebody like Ahab and Jezebel or Manasseh or one of these horrible kings, um, and what did they do? They, they're the ones that set, oh Solomon for heaven's sake, set up the places to worship other gods, even child sacrifice. They're the ones that led the people away because the king and the people all assumed that the king was the one who was supposed to be leading the religious way. Now, those of you who are in church history class, you, you've been reading, if you were in the last term, about how you know the king of Spain, the king of France, the, the, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, they all assumed that they were the ones that were supposed to be leading the way in terms of the religion. In fact, that, that frequently got into problems because they got into a conflict over is it the Pope in Rome or is it the king who historically, based upon the way it was in Scripture, the Old Testament, the king was the one who was responsible for sort of leading the way in terms of religion. And so throughout the history of the Christian church, there's been this constant battle. Is it the political king, the one in, in, who has secular authority, who's supposed to be leading the way for the church, or is it a religious, an ecclesiastical authority? Well, there was no question about that in the Old Testament. It was the same person. Um, you know, they didn't have a pope. They did have prophets. Now, the reason the prophets come along, and the reason the prophets, for many of the prophets, their primary audience was not the people in many cases. It was the king. Because the king was the one taking them in the wrong directions. This is the reason that that on those charts, okay, um, let me back up here so that I can make this point to you. Okay, slowly, back up, <laughs> back up. Okay, go forward. <laughs> All right. There is a reason why in this kind of chart, when we're talking about the major prophets, we talk about during the reigns of. Well, why is that so important? Because these people were the primary people they were talking to. That was their primary audience. Yes, they sometimes, Jeremiah, for instance, quite a bit, would do things and preach to the people. But usually they would do that when the king wouldn't listen. Because if they could get the king to listen, then the king would make changes that would affect the way people worshipped. And so who was king is critically important because that was really the primary audience for most of these prophets. In the case of Isaiah, you know, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the last of the ones, and he convinced Hezekiah, do not give in to the Assyrians, and God honored that. And 185,000 woke up to find themselves dead. Um, so, you get that, right? You see why, why the, who the king was was so important. They were the religious leader in the country, even more than the high priest. And the prophets were sent to try to hold the king's down <clears throat> when they wandered off in the wrong direction. Yes? What did he do? What did Isaiah do to get Saul in hand? Uh, well, he spoke the truth of God and Manasseh, who, strangely enough, was the grandson of Hezekiah, who was a good king, a king who he, he didn't have very, sometimes didn't have the best political sense, but he really was trying to do the right thing for God. Uh, Hezekiah's grandson Manasseh comes along and, and disconnects all that his father Josiah and all that his grandfather Hezekiah had put in place. And he wanted to worship other gods. You know, and you say, well, why would you want to worship other gods? Well, because there were things like ritual prostitutes were part of the deal. Okay? You, the fact that you no longer had to worry about ethical treatment, you know, ethical treatment of other people. You got whatever you wanted if you were an authority. There were all sorts of kind of political and pleasure-oriented things that the other false religions would give you. Manasseh comes along. He wants to get away from Yahweh, focus on these other gods that he thinks are more fun, and he's still got this guy Isaiah who's standing up there preaching and coming into court and talking to people and having influence, saying, you're a sinner before God, Manasseh. I don't care if you are the king. You better straighten up or there is judgment coming on you. Well, kings didn't like to hear that. And so, he had him sawed in half. At least tradition says he was sawed in half. We do, we're pretty confident he was killed. Uh, after Manasseh the king came. What okay. was the punishment for the king? Uh, well, he ended up losing his losing his kingdom. Um, mm -hmm. And Manasseh, I'll have to go back and look. When you look at some of these other guys, um, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah under Jeremiah, and then Zedekiah, you'll notice, carries over here. 
and there's some other kings, they ended up being at best vassals, meaning they had to, they had to be a servant of the Assyrian or the Babylonian king, whoever it was that took over. In some cases, they were killed. You know, one of them was flayed alive. Uh, one of them was taken off into captivity in um, in Babylon, and I think he became the, the the mounting block. They said for the rest of his life for the king for for Nebuchadnezzar. Meaning, he had to kneel down and have the guy step on his back to get on his horse, and he had been the king before that. Um, so. Some of them were killed, some of them were just uh, put into exile, some of them were humiliated. Um, back in those days it was a big deal. I mean, when I said a guy got flayed, there were cases we know of where, where as a sign of their power, if somebody defeated another king, they'd either take their head or sometimes their skin and put it up on the wall in their palace because to show, okay, that's what happens to people who disagree with me. So, it's not, this was not a happy time to be a king if you weren't, if you weren't number one. Uh, so. Okay, um, I want to get into now the particular details of, I want to walk us through the book of Isaiah itself. I've done all this. But before we do that, um, let's take a break. Walk through Isaiah. I'm going to move fairly quickly through this, but I do want to give you kind of the major sections. And part of the reason, I don't mean standing up here talking, it doesn't all sink in, but... All of this material is online, and so you have an opportunity to go in and look at the outline that I've created, and as I talk about it, maybe make connections with that stuff. So the first, um, the, what they used to call First Isaiah, I'm not going there because I believe the prophet Isaiah wrote all of this, um, but the first half of it, approximately, this is the first 39 chapters, what some have called First Isaiah, does have a distinctive here and now kind of approach to it. It is focused on um, what is happening historically during Isaiah's life, whereas when you get into the second section, he's looking forward in the future. The first three chapters of Isaiah are called the covenant lawsuit because in it, Isaiah starts right out of the chute and kind of hits the people of Judah right between the eyes, uh, accusing them of denying God, of uh, violating the covenant blatantly. He had, it's, it's a scathing criticism that he has against them. In fact, uh, the first few verses of the first chapter, Isaiah, starting the second verse, he calls upon heaven and earth to bear witness, to, be tested, to bear testimony to how horribly, badly, the people of Judah have denied the covenant with God. Um, he goes on and he pictures, Isaiah pictures Yahweh God sitting as judge, sitting in the seat of a judge to evaluate and judge and pass sentence against the people of Judah because of their failure. That's why this is called the covenant lawsuit. Um, Isaiah literally gives us a picture of a courtroom where the, the, the people who are being uh, charged are the people of Judah, the, Jews, uh, the Jewish people of Judah, and the judge is Yahweh himself. But Yahweh speaks up, and he says that he has raised the, the people of Judah as his own children, or literally sons, that they have rebelled against him, they no longer know him. The prophet Isaiah then speaks up and says, well, even a dumb donkey knows who is responsible for feeding them and taking care of it. Uh, and yet the, Israel, the, Judy, the people of Judah, again, I keep wanting to call them Israelites because they are, but it confuses it because the, the two nations. The people of Judah um, don't even recognize that God is the one who made them, that God blessed them, that God has made them into his people, and that they're the ones uh, that, that they need to be giving credence and uh, appropriate thanks to God for his blessings. goes on to say that the people have forsaken Yahweh, they have spurned the Holy One of Israel, and they have turned their backs on him. You need to understand that especially in this time in history, and it's followed through today, I mean, if you if you meet somebody who is a king or a queen, you're still not supposed to turn your back on them, because that's a sign of disrespect. If the Queen of England is, is having visitors, you're supposed to walk in, you know, and bow and greet the Queen, and when you leave, you back out. You never turn your back on somebody who's royal. In those days, that was considered such an insult that you'd be killed for it. And so when they say that you've turned your back on Israel, they don't just mean you're ignoring, or you, you, that the, the people of Judah have turned their back on God. It doesn't just mean they're ignoring him. It means they have disrespected him. They have, have not acknowledged his authority and the respect that he is due. Um, and so they've shown a serious insult. 
Then Isaiah goes on to describe the coming judgment that they will, the people will suffer invasion, the destruction of their cities and their fields, and a decimation of the population. He reiterates all of the curses that were written back in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28 is a whole series of curses that the people will experience if they violate the covenant commitment they've made to Yahweh God. Isaiah reiterates the fact that all of the, that God meant it when he established those curses for violating the covenant, and you guys are in for it because you have failed. Now, um, one of the major indictments that, that Isaiah starts with right here, one of the major ways in which the, Israel, the uh, people of Judah have denied God and uh, fallen short of the covenant is through their religious ritualism. That they've gone on carrying on ritual, they pretended, in effect, to, to be in a relationship with Yahweh because they continued to do the sacrifice and other things, at the same time that they worshipped other gods. There was this syncretism between worshipping other gods and worshipping Yahweh. And Yahweh God indicates that he's actually gotten annoyed at them because of their worship of him. Because it's just going through the motions. They don't mean it. He's annoyed. He's not going to listen to them anymore. He's not going to even listen to their prayers. Um, and it says in Isaiah 117, Take your evil deeds, your hypocritical worship and bloodshed, out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. So this is the second point. The idea that you have an obligation to care for the people who are in need. All of this is still part of this initial covenant lawsuit. Um, and yet, right in the midst of this, Yahweh speaks up and says that it is still possible for the people's sins to be forgiven. It is still possible if they will repent and change their ways that he will continue to bless them. That judgment is not inevitable. And he's, it's sort of like at that point, there's a, there's a pause, <laughs> waiting to see if the people will speak up and say that they repent. There is no response. Isaiah records no response from the people. And so he continues at the end of the first chapter to list the many sins of the people to declare that they are going to be judged for this. Um, then, again, chapter 2, and you see this, the threat of punishment and the glimmer of hope. The threat of punishment and the, the small promise of restoration for repentance. At the start of the second chapter, there is an introduction of the future hope, not just for the people of Judah, not for the Jewish people, but for all nations, and that they would all be included in God's wonderful restoration if they will seek Him and follow Him. Um, this is the passage that gets into, uh, and if you will seek me and follow me and be in a relationship with me, I will give you a time of peace, and people will be able to beat their swords into plowshares. You know that expression. This is in Isaiah 2. In fact, as you go through Isaiah, you will get all kinds of these little you know, references and metaphors and analogies and symbols that you've heard many, many times. And here, one of the promises God makes is, if you will come back to me and worship me and be in a relationship with me, I will give you peace, and peace such that you won't have need swords anymore. You can beat your swords into plowshares. And you know what, that a plowshare is the point of a plow. And it, one of the most important inventions in human history was a metal plow, because it's able to, to plow deeper, to go through rocks. They used to make them just out of wood. In fact, they used to just be a stake, you know, a stick that they drove through. <coughs> And you hit a rock and it breaks and you can't dig deep and all sorts of things. So a plowshare was critically important. It's like the difference in having a tractor or not nowadays. Um, <coughs> and so all through this first covenant lawsuit, identifying the failings and the sins of the, of the people of Judah, promising them that if they turn back to, to God, he will bless them, but telling them what's going to happen if they don't. We then have one of the uh, very colorful analogies, the branch of Yahweh. It is a, there are a lot of different messianic images in here. And in chapter 4, we get a look at a restoration that will, be, that will occur at the appearance of the branch of Yahweh, which is, uh, again, a messianic reference, uh, sign of the return, powerful return of the presence of Yahweh into the people's lives. And they use images from the Exodus, from the, ex the book of Exodus, and that is that God will be present to them in a cloud by day and fire by night. We then have another analogy, um, and that is of the vineyard. You know that the vineyard is a strong symbol throughout the New Testament. Jesus talked a lot about the vineyard. I am the vine, you are the branches. He talks about uh, the, the vineyard as a symbol of people's covenant relationship with God. 
Well, that Isaiah focuses on that very heavily and says that the, the people of Israel and Judah have ruined Yahweh's vineyard and that God has planted this with the idea of the vineyard being a sign of the people of God. It's a symbol for the people of God. That God has planted this, has created this with the idea that he would get good fruit from it, from it and instead he finds only bad fruit. And so because he's only gotten bad fruit, he will remove the protective hedge from around his people so that they will, be, uh, will not be protected, they will be destroyed, and particularly they will be destroyed because of foreign invasion. Now, it's at this point, I mean earlier even, but at this point I mentioned before, justice and righteousness are, are hammered over and over and over again. That's what people should be reaching for, for justice, justice for the poor and the downtrodden and those in need, righteousness meaning the righteousness of God, because justice and righteousness are two of the primary characteristics of God, according to Isaiah. And so the people are expected to live in justice and righteousness, reflecting the God who they're in relationship with. And there are a lot of, you know, I'm sure when you read this in Hebrew, you'll pick this up. There are a lot of word plays in here. Okay, that was a joke. I, some of you may be in Hebrew, but I, I don't think so. I, I, I don't. I mean, I, at one time I could use it in tools. I can't anymore. It's been too long. But at one place, talking about justice and righteousness, it says that Yahweh God looked for justice, which is mishpat in Hebrew, and instead he found only bloodshed, bloodshed, which is mishpak. So there's a word play there. He looked for justice, mishpat, and instead he found bloodshed, mishpak. And likewise, he looked for righteousness, which is tzedakah, and in fact, instead he found only distress, tzedakah. Okay, very similar words. And so in Hebrew, remember, Hebrew is a very poetic language. And in the writings, the fact that we read it in English, we miss a lot of the symbolism of the poetry of the wordplay. And so we find that in here. And Isaiah goes on to proclaim woes. A woe is simply a statement that something bad is going to happen. As you have denied God, woe to those who call evil good, woe to those who call good evil, to those who acquit the guilty with a bribe, to die justice to the innocent. And um, then he describes, and this comes back over and over again, and the main way you're going to feel this is because you're going to be invaded by foreigners. We then have the call of Isaiah. Most of the books, like Jeremiah and others, they start out by saying, here's how I came to have this job. Here's how God called me. Isaiah starts out, jumping right into the diatribe against the sins of the people. And in Isaiah 6, he then describes how he was called. And it's, it's a very vivid theophany. Theophany is a word which means a, a meeting with God, all right? a, a, a vision of God, theophany. Uh, there are very few places in the Old Testament where there's a sense in which people are present before God himself. Ezekiel has a theophany. Um, there, there is Moses has a theophany where he puts him in the cleft of the rock and walks by him. Well, there is a theophany where Isaiah describes seeing God. Now, he doesn't, he can only describe God's feet in the hem of his robe because he's afraid to look up. But he has a vision of God on his throne, and he's aware of the fact that seraphim, seraphim is one of the categories of angels. Seraphim literally means the burning ones. That there are seraphim angels circling around the, um, the, the head of God singing praises to the glory of God. Uh, and, and so Isaiah describes how he had an actual meeting with God, but was afraid to look up. Um, C.S. Lewis points out that when, um, when Jesus said in the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, Lewis comments that the reason for that is because only the pure in heart could look at God and live. You truly would have to be pure of heart, or you can't, could not stand the presence of God. Well, Isaiah is blessed with an experience of the presence of God, but he's not willing to look into his face. The passage then goes on into um, specific descriptions of what this interaction, this theophany is. And at the very, at one point in there, Isaiah is feeling so sinful and so impure, and I am not worthy, you know, to be here in the presence of God, to hear God's words. And so one of the uh, seraphim goes to a brazier. It's a... a, a open pit of coals, takes a coal out and takes it over and touches Isaiah's mouth with it, and in doing so makes him holy and makes the words that will proceed from his mouth to be the words of God. 
And so that is how his sinfulness has turned into something God can use. And then Yahweh God says, um, who will go on my behalf? Who will be my spokesperson? And Isaiah says, and again you've heard this, here am I, send me. Okay. Samuel had a very similar thing when Samuel was a young man at the temple. And he heard God's voice and Samuel said, here, here am I, send me. But Isaiah accepts the call of God. He is to go and proclaim to the people the truth. But God then tells him that when you proclaim the truth, don't be shocked when they don't listen. Because I will harden their hearts. This is one of those places, like with Pharaoh, it happened, and some other places, that part of the judgment against people who reject God is that they lose the ability to come back to God. And so part of what God is saying here is that they're not all going to turn because I have hardened their hearts as a judgment against them for the fact that they didn't desire me despite our covenant. Uh, in fact, interestingly enough, the most quoted Old Testament passage, quoted in the New Testament, that is, is Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, which says that the people will be ever hearing but never understanding. That gets quoted in seven different places in the New Testament. The idea that those who reject God will lose the ability to receive Him. In a sermon from Mark, where this was a, a passage talks about the hardening of the hearts, um, my description of it is, it's as though if you're a rebellious child and you insist on running away from home, you may not be able to find a way back again. This is what God is saying. Those who have left me, who have, who have consciously, willfully denied my covenant relationship with them, I will harden their hearts so that they can't return. Now God always suggests in there that those who truly do repent, who truly are a broken spirit, that He will accept them back. So this hardening of the heart, it seems is not for it. It does not include those who truly recognize their sin, confess their sin, repent, and desire again the relationship with God. But for those who are kind of cavalier about it, God is actually going to make it harder for them to come back if they reject it. And he warns Isaiah that that's going to be the case. And Isaiah then asks God, he says, well, how long will that go on? And God says, until the land is destroyed and the people exiled. Which means, ultimately, the exile will come not from the Assyrians, but then later from the Babylonians. All right? Now, the next section we have is where uh, Isaiah, by inspiration of God, introduces the idea of the coming child, the Holy One of Israel, he's called. Now, that expression, Holy One of Israel, is almost unique to Isaiah um, in, in terms of a, an expression that's used. And this Holy One of Israel, who is a representative of Yahweh and embodies Yahweh, uh, is throughout this whole section a, a major theme, a central theme. We have three chapters, Isaiah 7, 8, and 9, particularly starting out, where they, they have a declaration that there is a special child that is coming, and that should be expected, and there will be a sign. I mentioned to you earlier that Yahweh wants to encourage Ahaz the king. God is actually wanting to give him some encouragement so that he'll be strong in the Lord. And he tells Ahaz, um, ask me for a sign, whatever you want, and I will prove to you that I will be there for you. And Ahaz goes, oh, no, no, I can't, I can't ask God for a sign. That might be, you know, I might be tempting fate. And so God said, well, if you're that dumb, I will give you a sign anyway. And the sign will be that a virgin will be with child and give birth to a child, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us. Well, um, because of Ahaz's lack of faith, that sign is both a sign of restoration, but also a sign that there's judgment coming on Judah. And that child in Isaiah 8, a child is born. Now again, the word virgin can be interpreted uh, young woman, and maiden. But usually when it's used in the Bible, that word's used several times, it does mean virgin, you know, an unmarried uh, young woman. Um, but a child is born, a son of Isaiah, and the child is given the name Maher Shalal Hajbaz. That's why I didn't have that on the tip of my tongue that you asked before. Today. <laughs> Maher Shalal Hajbaz, which means quick to plunder and swift to the spoil. So, the prophecy about the coming child who would represent God as a sign, there is a restoration long term, but short term is represented by a child whose name means quick to plunder, swift to spoil. In other words, is representing the judgment that is coming against Israel. Short term. Okay? Um, now, that prediction is, the prediction is given, 
that also that Syria and Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, which is still around by that time, okay, that's not who Isaiah is talking to, but it's still around. Syria and Israel had gotten together. What happened was they asked Syria and Israel, which are two other nations, the nation of Judah, is who we're talking about right now. They had asked Judah to join them in rebellion against the Assyrians. And uh, the king of Judah said, no, I'm not going to do that. So Syria and Israel get together and attack Judah because they won't, Judah won't join them. That's called the Syrio-Ephraimite War. Well, because that's just now happening for all of this, part of what the prophecy of this, new child, of this child is, is that those two will be destroyed. Sure enough, Assyria comes down, destroys the nation of Syria. Now, differentiate, Assyria is the big kingdom. Syria is a small country. And in uh, 722 destroys the northern kingdom of Israel and their capital city in Samaria. Part of that was a judgment against the fact that they attacked Judah when Judah was really trying to be true to God. All right? Um, that prophecy about the child is, is a kind of prophecy which is called a typology. Typology is a kind of prophecy or a kind of statement even which has both a short-term and a long-term aspect. A child is born now who is going to represent the judgment that is coming. But then there will be another child, the fulfillment of that prophecy in the future, which will represent the next desire of God, and that is for restoration. That is the Messiah, Jesus. Okay. Um, stop me if you get any questions about any of this as we go along. Yes? When they took over the uh, towns, cities, did they just wipe everybody out? Well, they didn't wipe everybody out because then you don't get anything out of it. What they would do is conquer them. Um, in some cases they did, uh, depending upon what the situation was. For instance, quite often if a city in those days would, um, would surrender, then they would take maybe one out of ten. That's what the word decimate means, by the way. Decimate doesn't mean kill everybody. Decimate means kill one out of ten. They would perhaps decimate, decimal, tenth. Um, the, for somehow, somehow in English that's come to mean kill, you know, to destroy everything. It actually means one in ten. The Romans used that. If, if they were opposed, then they might kill all of the adult males and take the women and children off into slavery. But if a, if a city surrendered or surrendered pretty soon, what they might do is take uh, one in ten and either sell those into slavery or kill one in ten just as a sign of their authority. But then the others would have to work for them and they'd have to pay taxes. Again, you kill everybody, nobody's there to pay taxes anymore or tribute. And so they usually would not, unless somebody really, you know, really fought back and, and gave you a hard time about it. It took a lot of effort. And, you know, some of your own people died. But in most cases, they would simply capture them and, and take advantage of them, make them a vassal. Okay. All right. Uh, Question. Yes. Question. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, that helped a lot with the the way there's three uh, different. Uh, interpretations of this in the book. Okay. But basically it's only happened once in scripture where they have two children forecast or uh, a demon fly. Um, and, and so it's confusing to me. He means yeah. it in one sense but then he was also talking about Christ. Yeah. And I, you mentioned earlier about three. I'm not remembering off the top of my head what that reference is in here. So yeah. why don't I look at that a little bit later? Maybe we can talk about that first of next week. You know, we'll bring it back up. 358. Okay. I, I'm not off the top of my head. This is the section, by the way, where the description of the child who will be um, a descendant of King David, the Davidic promise, this is where it talks about the child as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, which I quoted earlier as one of the key verses here. Um, again, the emphasis is justice and righteousness, that uh, God will be represented by this dramatic uh, leader that will come as a child and then grow up. <coughs> it's in this place, too, that we begin to see, there is, in the Old Testament, there's a, what's called a theology of remnant. Even though the vast majority of the people might turn away, might worship other gods, might reject Yahweh, there is, and it's introduced here as strong as anywhere else, for instance, in, um, in Isaiah 10 and 11. God promises there always will be a remnant, a small group of people who will remain loyal. When we look at the history of the Christian church, the same thing is true. There have been various times in, in Christianity when even the majority of people have gone in the wrong direction. There's always been a remnant. There's always been the seed from which 
renewal can come and God's will can again be can, can again be manifest. Well, that that idea, that theology of remnant, that a small group will always be available that are true to God, that starts really here in Isaiah more than anywhere else. Okay? And so that theology of remnant comes out. In Isaiah 11, they talk about more about the fact that that remnant will be linked to uh, the Davidic king who will come, who is the son, the servant. There are several references. They talk about the fact that it will be a shoot or branch coming out of the stump of Jesse. Remember who Jesse was? David's father. So they refer to David as being from the stump of Jesse, and they're talking about the new Davidic king that they're expecting down the road, the Messiah. The servant is talked about in places that the holy one, the child, will be also a descendant from Jesse and from David. So stump of day, uh, Jesse is a poetic way of saying that. Okay, And when that person comes, they will institute justice and righteousness and a time of peace. This is where you get the passage that says the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat. Um, this is where the promise of a future miraculous peace will occur. And there's been all kinds of theological estimations about is that a literal lion and lamb lying down together? Is it a figurative thing talking about peace being you know, uh, evident in the world? And that depends on who you ask. Are you a, you know, are you a premillennial dispensationalist? Are you an amillennialist? All of that gets into there. Okay? Um, but the point is, from the root of Jesse, not only the people, the Jews, but all nations of the earth will be blessed when the new Davidic king comes and will be the ruler, the righteous one of God over all the nations of the earth. Okay? Isaiah 13 to 23, we then have a passage about the judgment of the nations. Remember the fact that Isaiah makes a point, as do other um, prophets, of saying God is not just the God of the Hebrew people. They, the Hebrew people are a special select people, and he has had a distinct plan, but God is the God of all the nations, and he will judge those nations based upon how they act, either to, either to judge them in punishment or judge them in blessing. And in these passages from 13 to 23, we actually have specific oracles spoken against the following list of nations. Against Babylon, against Assyria, against Philistia, where the Philistines were from, against Moab, Damascus, and then a general summary in the 17th chapter about all nations. Against Cush, Cush was a black African nation south of Egypt, and during much of the time that Isaiah was a prophet, the African nation of Cush actually was in control of Egypt. So they talk about Cush and Egypt, and then Cush and Egypt at one point. So you get Cush, you get Egypt, then Egypt and Cush together, Babylon again, Duma, Arabia, Jerusalem, and Tyre. All of those nations are specifically identified, and there are oracles against them um, that Yahweh is master and lord over all of those nations as well, and he will judge them, and he will um, judge them harshly unless they turn to him, in which case, if they trust him, he will bless them. And again, remember, this comes right after the place where he says that this descendant of David who is the, the one, the child, who will grow up and be the righteous one, the wonderful counselor, the idea if the nations will turn to him, since he's supposed to be over all the nations, then they will be blessed. Um, try to figure out how much detail I want to go into. I think you get the idea there. In, in fact, when he talks about all those nations being blessed toward the end of this section, he, in, uh, he actually talks about, for instance, Egypt and Assyria, and he says that they will be, there will be a highway between Egypt, which was the power in the south, and from Assyria, which is the power in the north, that will bring both of them to, uh, to Jerusalem, and that together with the righteous uh, Jews, they will worship God, and he calls those who worship God from Egypt, he calls my people, from Assyria, he refers to as my handiwork. So again, this whole section is, both God's judgment and God's blessing apply to all the nations of the world, not just to uh, the Jewish people. Okay? Questions about any of that? Okay, I'm going to start ripping through some of this stuff. Is he really the first to propose that God is for all the nations uh, and his rules are, but his blessings are too? Well, he's the first prophet because to do so because he's the first prophet. 
I mean, the first literary prophet. Okay. But he's certainly not the first one to suggest that theme because God, when God called Abraham, he said, and all the nations of the earth would be blessed through you. When God reiterated the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham's son Isaac, he included, God said, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And Isaac's son Jacob, when they renewed the covenant with Jacob, he said, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Jeremiah, later on, but still, there were other prophets, Jeremiah is very specific in saying that, you know, um, all of the peoples of the earth will see the great light. So this is a message, and it's astonishing how, how little people are aware of that. The Old Testament is full of references to the fact that while the Israelites, the Jewish people, are uniquely chosen as the special people of God to be his sort of platform for working at his will so that the rest of the, of the world can see it, over and over and over and over again, almost every time a major declaration of God's commitment to his people is made, it also says, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. So, yeah, Isaiah is the first prophet to talk about it, but that's because he's the first literary prophet. Okay. All right. So basically they're hearing, but not really. Yeah, it doesn't sink in. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. duh. <laughs> How often is that true? Again. All right, Isaiah 24 to 27. Um, is a statement, and this is sort of a summing up of the judgment on the nations, in which it says God, uh, Yahweh's judgment will be on the whole world. He will judge not only the nations, but all of creation will be judged by Yahweh. Um, this is the section that is sometimes called the Isaiah Apocalypse, because it has sort of apocalyptic language. It's not apocalyptic in the way that Revelation is or Daniel is, for instance, but it, there is some sense in which there is a judgment uh, by a representative of God, and the best way to see this, uh, these chapters is it's kind of a summing up of the judgment on the nations that came before that. Then Isaiah 28 to 35, the, the judgment followed by deliverance. Again, Isaiah could almost be called the prophet of the carrot and the stick, you know, or the stick of carrot. There is judgment, you know, if you, if you uh, don't repent, there will be judgment, but there is still restoration if you, you know, if you will seek God. Judgment, but restoration and forgiveness. Judgment, but forgiveness and restoration. So here, after, after the judgment on the nations and Yahweh's judgment on the world, we have deliverance. Um, the idea that, that God will bless if the people turn back to him. Now here's one of the places, for instance, that uh, Isaiah talks about Jerusalem's reliance on just going through the motions of religious ritualism. And here's where God says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus quotes that passage in both Matthew and Mark in the New Testament, that they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So this idea of um, making sure that you are seeking a, a relationship with Yahweh God and not just going through the religious motions, because that's insufficient. We then get a narrative, which I talked about. This is the very last part of this first big section, the first half, of Hezekiah and the Assyrians. It goes from being a prophetic kind of pronouncements about judgment and about restoration and blessing to being a narrative form about what happened when King Hezekiah uh, and the Assyrian invasion. Now, again, the nation of Assyria had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722. About 20 years later, 21 years later, in 701, they now are outside the gates. This is recorded in 2 Kings 18 to 20. And again, Assyria was the world power then. During various times here, Assyria and Egypt would be against each other, um, and people were trying to pick sides, and then later on, Assyria was destroyed by Babylon. But during this time, Assyria is outside, finally, after not paying attention, for instance, the Syrio uh, Ephraimite War when uh, the nation of Israel and Syria got together to attack Judah because they wouldn't rebel with them, join with them to rebel against Assyria. At that time, against recommendations, Hezekiah had called on the Assyrians and said, would you help? You know, would you come down and protect us? And Isaiah said, don't do that. Rely on God. Well, surely enough, the Assyrians came down, they destroyed Syria, they destroyed the northern, northern kingdom of Israel, and what did they do a few years later? Their, park, their whole army is parked outside Jerusalem getting ready to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah because they got invited in. Just like the Maccabeans invited the Romans to come and help them against the, the, um, the Seleucids. 
Sure enough, the Romans came and drove off the Seleucids, and then they had the Romans to deal with. Same thing here. Well, they're sitting outside the gate. Hezekiah has not listened. He's not a bad guy, but he has not listened very well on some things. But this time he does listen to, um, in Isaiah 38, when Isaiah tells Hezekiah, do not give in. God will make it all right. 185,000 of the Assyrians die apparently from a plague. They all go back home, and the southern kingdom of Judah is saved. And continues to exist until 586. So we've got another 125 years or so uh, after that before they eventually do fall to the Babylonians. Okay? Um, any questions about that first half? This is the stuff that happened during Isaiah's lifetime. Okay? Questions? I got 15 minutes to do the next five, the 2,000 years or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, this is the thing I was looking for. I mean, I've got some notes here. You know, this is, to give you an idea, you've seen all those scraps and things. This is what the scroll of Isaiah looks like, if you can see that from back there, from in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a whole scroll. It's the whole thing. And so we've got a very clear sense of what it was that they were working on. Okay, the second section, which, again, liberal scholars call Deutero-Isaiah, or Second Isaiah, we just believe it's recording a, the next phase. Uh, the first 39 chapters talk about God's plan to, to uh, judge or to bless. Now we get into the time when it's actually happening. So Isaiah 40 to 46 uh, to 66. Let me give you a little bit of story. This is actually the whole rest of the book. And there's some similarities on these. And then I'll look at the two sections. First, this last half or second half of the book talks about um, people who are in exile. It's no longer Isaiah talking to the people of Judah and the king of Judah now still working. He's talking about the future, and he's referring to the people in exile. One good analogy that I heard of this is it's almost as though uh, Isaiah is inspired by God to write a letter. It's as though he were a grandfather, and he's got a new grand granddaughter, and he knows that someday in the future, that granddaughter is going to get married. And he is probably not going to be there because he's old enough. He's probably not going to be there to wish her well and give her advice. So he writes a letter so that when she the day she does get married, they can give it to her and say, here's your grandfather's advice for you. Well, that's sort of what this is about. He's writing to exiles in the future to give them a perspective of what he knows of God. I think that's a good analogy for how we would understand this letter, this part of the letter, okay? So he's writing to the people in exile. There are no historical events, specific historical events mentioned. There also are no words addressed to specific kings or individuals like in the first 39 chapters. Um, a major theme is fear not. Don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. And with that fear not, there are words of comfort that Yahweh gives. Um, it's still true, however, that as with the first 39 chapters, Isaiah is being charged with violating the covenant. They still have not gotten it right. And yet salvation is promised, again, as with the first 39 chapters, both in the near term and in the long term, and including the Gentiles. Uh, Yahweh refers to his people in personal, uh, intimate terms, this idea of relationship with his people. Um, it also is a sec There are sections where Yahweh is praised for his many awesome attributes. His holiness, his sovereignty, his power, his control of history, his righteousness, his justice, there is identifying uh, things to be praised in Yahweh. There are, again, strong polemics against idols and against the nations. There's a wonderful passage in, in, in this section of Isaiah where the Isaiah is writing in a, a really sarcastic, cynical, ironic way about, oh, yeah, that's great. The guy goes out and cuts down a tree, takes half of it, and burns it to keep himself warm, and he makes an, an idol out of the other half and worships it. That makes a lot of sense, you know, and there really is a very sarcastic appropriate way. And then Cyrus, the king of Persia, is presented as Yahweh's instrument of judgment on Babylon and his deliverance for Israel. Again, Cyrus was born 150 years, or lived 150 years after Isaiah. So this is all prophetic. Let's go through some of these different uh, sections. Isaiah 40 is be comforted and soar like an eagle. Again, you probably know the passage says they will walk and not be tired. They will, um, they will walk and not stumble. They will run and not be tired. They will soar up on wings like eagles. Okay, um, That's from this passage, this section of Isaiah. And it is a statement of blessing. The idea that God will um, 
bless his people. He will encourage them. Um, he is an all-powerful being. The idols can't compare to him. But if, if Yahweh's people will obey him and not despair, they will walk and not stumble. They will run and not be weary. They will soar up on wings like eagles. That God will bless them in those ways. By the way, a great interpretation that I heard one time had to do with the nature of healing. Some of you may have heard me say that. The idea that um, they, will, they will walk and not stumble. They will run and not be weary. They will soar up on wings like eagles. Well, soaring up on wings like eagles is to be miraculously healed. Yeah. To run and not be weary means it may take a long time and it may involve medical care, but that you can be cured or you at least can be, you know, you can live. And they will walk and not stumble means those people who have illness that cannot, that are not miraculously cured, that are not cured by medicine or doctors, but that God will sustain them so that they can continue to, to move forward for as long as he has them on the earth. Uh, to me, that was a very meaningful kind of thing. Anyway, and that's from this section, Isaiah 40. <clears throat> Isaiah 41, fear not, I am with you. Here's that fear not theme where Yahweh is talking about his power over the nations and the idols. Here, not by name, but by reference, uh, there's implicit, God will raise up Cyrus as an example of one that he will use as his tool to make his will uh, done. He uses comforting words for the Israelites. He exhorts the people not to fear because he is with them. This fear not, this comfort that we talked about before, um, that his presence will be power and empowering to them. And he begins, begins to get in chapters uh, for, in this section, uh, really between 40 and 45, four passages which are called the Song of the Servant of Yahweh. The first one comes in here, a clear messianic reference. That, um, and then, of course, New Testament on, we've connected these servant songs to Jesus. Um, the servant will, be, will have the spirit of Yahweh, will establish justice on the earth, will be quiet and meek, will be the creator of all life, will be the one who proclaims what's going to happen before it happens. And that Yahweh will make this servant a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free the captive from prison, to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. If that sounds familiar, Jesus quotes this passage when he starts his ministry. You know, he's baptized, he spends time in the wilderness when he goes up north to Galilee and he goes into the city of uh, into Nazareth, appears at the temple, he reads this passage from Isaiah. And when he says... The uh, eyes of the blind will be opened, the captives will be freed uh, and released, those who sit in darkness will receive a great light. Jesus reads this passage from Isaiah and then says, today this has been fulfilled in your sight. So this messianic uh, song, the first song of the servant, and then the others come later on in Isaiah. Okay? Again, fear not, do not be afraid, I am with you, I have power. The idea comes in here about the Spirit of God being upon this servant and the Spirit of God being present. Clearly, um, pre-sages the idea of the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts. And it's here in um, Isaiah 44 that we have this polemic against idols. The idea that anybody who's stupid enough, and it really does say it's ridiculous, anybody who's stupid enough to make something with their own hands and then worship it, Come on, people, you know, there's this kind of duh uh, sort of thing. It's, it's really brilliant. Isaiah 44 to 48 is where Cyrus is specifically mentioned. Now, King Cyrus of Persia, he became king of Persia in 559 B.C., again, a long time after Isaiah. He, in 539 B.C., uh, 20 years later, he conquered the Babylonian Empire pretty much without a fight because Babylon had was really in bad shape by then. And then in 538, one year later, it was King Cyrus who gave the Israelites freedom to go back to Palestine. And that's where you get, you know, um, Ezra is involved there, Jer um, Zerubbabel, they go back and they rebuild the temple, and then they re and then Nehemiah comes along, they rebuild the wall around it. All of that is as a result of Cyrus defeating Babylon and giving the Jews the freedom to go back home, okay? Um, in this passage, and when they introduce Cyrus, the whole focus is that God has the ability to control history, to predict the future, to bring events into uh, to happen that he had foretold. And again, this is the whole theme of Isaiah, the idea that you say, okay, well, Isaiah couldn't have been telling the future because you can't do that. That's kind of the whole point of this book, is what is God going to do, either in judgment or in blessing. 
We then get the servant and the Zion. The servant and Zion, these are the other three of the four servant songs. Um, in 49.50 and 52.53, we have this idea that beyond Cyrus, beyond the return of the Israelites, there will be a major character who comes along who will restore all things, make all things new, will restore and renew Zion, which is the idea, Zion means Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city of Zion. Now it came to mean the, the nation of Israel later on, but the, the historic nation of Israel. And so this section, the servant and Zion, really introduces the messianic expectation in a big way. I mean, there's been some of that before, but the three songs of the servant introduce this messianic expectation and the Zionistic expectation. The Hebrew people, those have been two major emphasis. The, originally, there was the idea that they're waiting for the Messiah. That was a major emphasis. In the 1940s, with the, the creation of the nation of Israel, the idea of Zionism is the word, means an emphasis on a Jewish national state and the return to that state. The emphasis sort of left the messianic expectation and began to be much more focused on Zionism and the Zionistic expectation. Both of those are focused on in this, this section. Isaiah 49 to 55, the songs of the servant talk about the servant of God coming and the Zionistic expectation that Jerusalem will be restored and renewed. Now, this idea of restoration of Israel also includes the salvation of the nations. It's all wrapped up in that. And these are... Some of the passages where, again, we get we, uh, the, the, the third of these songs of uh, the servant, that is the fourth total one, the final one, is Isaiah 52 to 53, which is, it's been called the high water mark of Old Testament theology, because that's the passage I gave you earlier, the famous suffering servant that he has taken, you know, by his, his stripes we were healed, the fact that he has taken upon himself the sins of the whole world, and he went quietly to this judgment, even though he was innocent. This prophetic statement about the nature of Jesus Christ as being the one who saves us. That's in this, the, the, the songs of the servant that are here. Again, there are four. One of them occurs earlier. And then 49 to 55 of Isaiah is where the last three show up. That's, I've got a, a dotted line there because that's, it should be 40 to, to 55 up there. Sorry, the, the, type, the heading is wrong there. But through 55, that's the second section. And the third section, which I will do in three minutes, uh, it sort of changes gears again here, which is why some liberal scholars had said this, somebody else wrote this. And it focuses first on Israel's inability to live righteously. The fact that you people, no matter what I've done, no matter how many times I've called you, no matter how, how much I've made you aware that you will be judged, no matter how much I've promised to restore you, you still do not live righteously. And again, it focuses on the fact that God desires to give peace and forgiveness, but part of that is you can't worship other gods. You can't deny justice and righteousness to those who have needs. You can't just use religious uh, ritualism in order to try to get by. And here, specific, it addresses all of these. Here it specifically, in this section, 56 to 59, focuses on the inability of the people to care for the needs of those who are weaker than them. Major theme through here. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, those who do not have the socioeconomic capabilities to help themselves, we are supposed to help them, he says, to the Israelites. Um, okay, 60 to 62 comes back. Again, there's always this, you know, you're doing wrong in judgment, but I want to restore you. You're doing wrong in judgment, I want to restore you. And so 60 to 62, we get a, a beautiful picture of the future salvation that will come. Demon fly, as, as Ron calls them. Um, and the call, ultimately the call to ethical living. The call to live a righteous life. Not just for the sake of trying to win uh, favor, but because God has called us to that. God is holy, God is righteous, God calls us to live a holy and righteous life. And in these sections, by the way... Um, there's several places where Yahweh describes what he wants and describes himself. For instance, this is one of the passages that God describes himself. He says, for this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place and also with him who is, who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirits of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Shockingly, against 
Jewish expectations, these passages at the end here of Isaiah talk about the fact that the foreigner and even the eunuch, if they, if they love me and accept me and worship me, are my people, and they will live with me, as this says. You know, I will revive their spirit, revive the heart of the contrite, and they will live, me, live with me on high. All of these people that the Jews, like for instance, if you were a eunuch, you were not supposed to be allowed in the temple. If you weren't allowed in the temple, you couldn't be accepted by God. These passages clearly say, your rules don't apply, guys. Those who seek me and serve me and love me are my people, and I will draw them to myself. And contrary to that, uh, in Isaiah 58 here, it says, is not this kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the poor and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? In other words, is that not the kind of sacrifice I want? I don't care about your bulls. I don't care about your oil or your burnt offerings or your incense or anything else. What I want, the kind of fasting, the kind of service, the kind of sacrifice I want is to loose the chains of injustice untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free, to share your food with the hungry, and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter. That's what I want, God says. That's what true sacrifice is. The rest of it is just ritual. That's not sufficient. Okay? And we're going to stop there. Questions about any of that? I have walked you through all 66 chapters. So, um, go back and read it again. I did go kind of quick there at the end, but um, you get the idea. Any questions about any of that? Okay, next week, Jeremiah, uh, the weeping prophet. Weeping. He wept for a reason. So, God bless you all.